So here we are. Final hours of Iridia, the paths we dare tread. Hey, it's Chris, Luigi Games. Should you back it? Is it right for you? How does it compare to the other open world RPG sandbox-esque games that are out there, that are coming up, that are just sort of popping up all over the place nowadays? Let's talk. Because, you know, the elephant in the room, let's just get it right out of the way, right? It's expensive. It is the most expensive of these to date. And it raises a few interesting points. Points that I think deserve to be touched on that I'm not sure if other people are touching on them. Because you know me, I'm, you know, just a little bit crazy in my rambling sometimes. But things that come to my mind that I want to put out there. So, let's talk about this. Iridia, the paths we dare tread. What do you need to know? Who is it for? Who is it not for? How does it compare to those other games that I have just alluded to? And ultimately, should you back it or not? Let's talk. Let's pull up the pages and let's go from there. Now, it's interesting here. We're going to start off on the Board Game Geek page in case you weren't <laughs> aware of what you were actually looking at. 24 are already rating it as a 10. Seven people are already rating it as a 1. And another dozen are essentially also rating it very high. And you can see, again, I'll rate to offset. I'll rate because of the price, basically. Rating uh, from this side of things. Um, just, again, looking forward to it. Ratings too early. Unavailable, utterly unplayable. Again, it's another divisive, divisive game. I mean, look at this. This is just not even people pre-order, just want to play and things like that. So... <laughs> we'll update review. It's a 10 now, though. So let's go back to the page, though. So the thing that I think you need to know about this, as it is counting down literally uh, single-digit hours at the time you may be viewing this, already $1.1 million at the time of me filming this. It's almost at 9,000 backers, which is insane for the price point. Fully funded unlocking the stretch goals the num number one positive all right from the get-go is that they didn't put any fake funding bs goal they went with seven hundred twenty thousand dollars because they said this is what we think we're gonna get it's true it's also very lofty and so i'm not sure what if they had only gotten five hundred thousand what if people had said you know what this is five hundred thousand dollars because do you really need 720 to do everything. I, I'm sure there is a whole lot of calculus behind this. Calculations, not calculus. And if they did calculus on this, anyway, I'm getting rambling. But they talk about this in the FAQ as uh, why can't it be not a lower price? Is there anything you can do to decrease? No. Basically, the, the short answer is no, we're not going to do it. You either get what we want to do as a vision or not. And so I give them kudos for that. But at the same time, you know, it is what it is. Now, because I don't think you need some of these things. Would colored standees really have been that much worse off? Would you really be, from a thematic standpoint, less engaged from a colored standee approach with something like this? Instead of this interchangeable head-body system? Because I'll be frank with you, I wasn't a fan of it with Oathsworn that sort of did the changeable arms and manipulations and things like that. I'm not a fan of it with the tiny epic series with their little, uh, you know, holding hands and, you know, of weapons and that sort of thing. I thought that was kind of, well, lame, to be honest with you. I just didn't do anything for me. And I'm not really a big fan of them here. So I am in that camp where, you know what? You can knock 30 or 50 bucks off this price with standees. I guess I would be curious to see what the price point would be on a game like this and what the funding would be if they just said, we're going to do standees. Because you get a lot of people that are enticed by the miniatures. Now, you have the people that will also gripe about, oh, it's pre-painted. I don't want mine pre-painted. I want to pre-paint them myself. Whatever. You, you, you guys are the irregularity there. Now, let's talk about the pledge levels a second here. You can see I'm pledging right now at the 190 level. And that is because this is the only pledge level you should be pledging at. Well... I'll take that back. This is the only pledge level that you should end up getting. Because I'll say, if you only want to spend $1, totally understand it. If you want to get the 165 and then upgrade, totally understand it. This small bodies thing, again, don't care. 
Um, I, I don't, I don't know. This small bodies thing is again completely unnecessary from my side of things. So I think really, 190 is where you should be at potentially. That's my own personal opinion. If you're going to pledge, because of this epic hunt Kickstarter exclusive, as they compare it to in the FAQ of the Cell Sword ship expansion that was Kickstarter exclusive from Zaya. Now, if you go over to the Zaya Kickstarter page here. You can see the pledge level was $100, including the sell sword, and it was $75 for the base, so $25. And you can see the prices are going for about an average of $28 right here all along there. So it at least holds its value. You may make a few bucks. And again, with this one, I think you could make that argument that the same thing is going to happen. Now, the question is, though, and this is the other reluctance, is you better not be buying it just to flip it. Because I think there are now approaching 9,000 backers. I would not back it from a flipping standpoint. Because there are going to be people that, again, as I said on my Roundup videos repeatedly, that are going to buy this, that are going to look at this and treat it like Root and Oath from Leader Games, where they did not actually look at how it plays. They bought it on the premise and the idea of it in their head and not the actuality of the gameplay. And as soon as they see the actuality of the gameplay, they're going to flip it almost sight unseen or potentially really unshrink wrapped if you prefer that, if that makes more sense. And so the question is, the more people that are backing it, the more people that are going to be then flipping it. Because even if you say it's a certain strict percentage, if you say it's 1%, well, 1% 1 of 9,000 is a lot more than 1% of 900. So there's going to be a lot more availability on the secondary market, which means flipping it, unless you are literally flipping it the second you get it, the longer you wait. And we're already seeing that with Ankh right now. I saw two pledges for Ankh barely above what they paid for the all-in. Because it's been out for a couple weeks now, and people are just trying to flip it. Although if you wait, I mean, you can usually get a little bit more, but sometimes you just need the cash in these situations. And that is what you're potentially looking at here too. So will it hold its value? Yes, it will hold its value. But if you're banking on this, making bank, don't. Because it's a lot of money to tie up. It's a risk from that standpoint. Not a risk, again, let me be very clear about this. I have to reiterate this because otherwise somebody in the comment section is going to misquote me. It's not a risk from a value standpoint. The amount of stuff you are getting, the content that you are getting is worth it. It will hold its price. But I cannot guarantee or even highly think that you are going to make, say, $75 or $100 on flipping this. $25? $30? Sure. Much more than that? And are you willing to tie up $200 with over $200 with shipping then for a profit of less than 10%? Think about that one for a minute. So... Now that we've got the logistical side out of the way, what do you need to know about the actual game? This is an open sandbox leveling up tabletop RPG in a game. And the biggest question that you have to ask yourself in a game like this is how easy is this going to be to get to my table? Am I willing to get this to the table over other things? Is this going to slot ahead of other things? Because if it's not, this is a lot of money and a lot of hours to put on the shelf in the back burner. Do you have Frosthaven coming? Are you looking forward to Sanko Cushion? Do you have any Simon games and their shelves of plastic that could be displaced? What is going to be the rank order with this? Because all of these are taking up not necessarily money, not necessarily even shelf space, but frankly the most precious commodity of all, time. And there's only so much of that to go around. And can you allocate it enough that it outweighs the FOMO? Your characters are going to level up. It's going to be one to four players. The question is going to be, does it play as well at the higher player counts as it does? Because this reminds me of the tabletop role-playing game version of Seventh Continent. And that's what scares me a little bit. Because that Tainted Grail play beautifully at one, nay, even maybe two players. But how fluid is it? Is it as enjoyable? Is there as much upkeep? Is there as much engagement at the three and four player count? 
Now, you can make an argument that clearly with Zaya, yes. But this is not really a take that. This is more of an RPG. This is completely different at its core of one what this is. Now, the other thing that goes right along with that, since we're talking about Zaya right now, and before I lose my train of thought, I've heard, again, to go with my point just a minute ago, on people buying it, not uh, realizing or not even caring what it is until they get it in their house. I have heard too many comments in that regard of, well, I liked Zaya. He did awesome with Zaya. I loved Zaya, so I'm going to get Aridia. Like... That doesn't make any sense. Can you imagine doing that? If I did that with Simon, like, ah, well, I liked Arcadia Quest. I must like Zombie Side. I must like Rising Sun. I must like Rum and Bones, then. Like, think about how different those four games are that I just mentioned. Yes, there's some similarities. Or if you want to use something more comparison-wise, well, I like Blood Rage. That means I'm absolutely going to love Rising Sun and Ankh. Well, that's not true either. If anything, those three are drastically different in their approach to the same use of area control mechanics and are vastly different in who likes them, the player counts that they work, and how they actually incorporate the mechanic in the first place. And so you may see some similarities between this and Zaya, but let's be very clear, this is not Zaya. And guaranteeing you liked Zaya is not going to be a guarantee that you are going to like this. Stretch goals, I don't care. I I feel like in almost every campaign that is hitting six figures, mid, nay, 500,000 or more, I can't even look at them and not think most of them are pre-planned and aren't really necessarily true stretch goals. I, I... I, I've none, and that's not saying Iridia, that's me being a cynic across all crowdfunding campaigns now. There are very few, except for some of the small indie ones, that I dare say that are not pre-planned and will frankly just be included anyway. And it's just how matter of fact they are and how much they get stretched out based on the fact of how fast the campaign is going and where they're at. So it, it is what it is. I mean, the uh, nice thing that you have to worry about is that there's no other Kickstarter exclusives right here. So that's not a make it or break it from the stretch goals. There's not as much value added in the stretch goals when you see these other people commenting in, in the comment section like, oh, well, the stretch goals, like Monster Hunter World, for example. Well, the stretch goals were lackluster. I'm not going to back it because the stretch goals didn't impress me. Well, they weren't supposed to impress you. They weren't like actual stretch goals, right? They were pre-planned. They were pre-navigated. They were daily unlocks. These were set from the get-go. And it wasn't going to change the overall value of what they had in mind. They were going with something. And see you later if you're not on board with that. And I partially say that because of not putting them up beforehand. And I also say that because some of this stuff, as you hear designers that are that nuanced and that detail-oriented, I don't think would have stuff that they didn't already have plans for or balance for when you're adding new starting skill cards, new leveling up, new characters, things like that. Because otherwise you run into the Simon power creep with their expansions, where it feels a little bit half-baked sometimes with the power creep of the balance versus them compared to the core game. Again, the, the pedigree, I'm not arguing the pedigree about how good Zaya is. I'm just saying that to compare Zaya that you liked Zaya, that you liked this now, that doesn't work in my mind. These are two separate entities. I treat them equally separate. It does not influence me in that side of things. And I think that helps with decision making when it comes to this. Now, what does this have going for it if you're looking for this? This is going to be the closest thing to an RPG port from a video game side of things to the tabletop. If you are looking for that, this is your game so far, period. Now, this one, unlike a couple of the others that are upcoming in the next two months, like Mythwind and Artisans of Splendid Vale, this one is more combat adventure focused. Those two are more like Ghosts of uh, Tsushima, 
I believe it's called, I'm screwing the name up, where you are doing more other crafting. You are doing other adventuring styles, not necessarily battling being the key aspect in a key fight or flight sort of aspect like we're used to seeing and like people are really engaging with. This is that. But if that is not the crux of what you want, if you are not the big, I want to fight, I want to conquer, I want to level up and get stronger, well then you go look at one of those other twos or you get in with something like Lands of Gauzier, where those are all emphasizing more of the story. Now I'm not saying, again, this one doesn't have story, you know, discovering locations, lasting effects, interactions, talking with NPC characters and carrying over events like that. There's everything like that. But let's be clear, this is also a major component of things, and you have to be aware of that. Everybody likes loot. Again, I think I, I'm happy just not having loot boxes. Again, this is sort of superfluous to me. Again, it's a price point issue. I, I don't need my own individualized treasure chest. Just allow me to pick from a random card or from a random pile or from a random assortment. Give me a randomizer. This is adding cost. Now, again, it's an artist's standpoint, an artist's viewpoint of what they want the campaign to be, but it's, again, as a consumer, it is part of the board game inflation of prices that we are seeing and why this is 165 and 190 and not 100 and 130. It's why, potentially, and this is controversial, I guess, when maybe Frosthaven got that much more with that much less, backers and money-wise. Because there is something to be said about accessibility. When you are literally almost doubling the Frosthaven price for something like this. And I just say that as a statement of fact, not a judgment. Because, again, you've heard me say already, because I feel like I'm going to have to reiterate this, I, I really like this game. But these are all issues that I look at and I go, you know... I'm going to be critical because this is the video of should you back it, not let me just purely hype it up for you. If you want a hype video, I can make hype videos. Let me be clear. At the time of me filming this, you can see I'm still pledging it. <laughs> but I think these bigger projects deserve a bigger microscope. And you deserve to get that bigger microscope as someone who's willing to spend your money this much. Again, pre-painted, I've already talked about it. The setup is great. The adventure, okay, great. The paths, okay, that, that is their take on the classes. So you've got a bunch of that. Again, I didn't argue that this doesn't have enough content. And again, with said locations, it takes a macro into a micro, which is again, another aspect of this that makes it distinctly different. Lands of Galzir, you were going, you were having the story event at the place, but you were not going actually in the town and searching the buildings in the town. You just go to the town, go to the one spot in the town, choose the event and read it. This is, you are going around from the big spot right here on the big map down to here, and then maybe even blowing that up inside the building itself as you see what else is in there. And so that is the nuance that you want. That is like the Final Fantasy-esque, you know, zooming in. But do you want that? That's going to be more in-depth. Do you want more of the superficial? This is not going to be, let me be clear on that, I guess. This is not going to be a light, low overhead game. This is the draft rule book right now that is on... Uh, Google Docs or Microsoft Docs or whatever it is. And it's 37 pages right now. And yeah, it's not the most well laid out from that side of things, but this is very text heavy. This is very not straightforward, easy to read. I mean, this is, you know, this is not straightforward stuff. This is complicated, nuanced stuff more so than other games of this ilk. I mean, Lands of Galzir, reading through that rule book, getting that set up and played was a breeze. This is going to be much more complicated. This is going to be much more nuanced in that. And again, how much of that do you want? You have to know how to do all of these different aspects that I was just talking about, right? You have to know the rules of this, you have to know the rules of this. You have to know the rules of this. And that's a lot to know. 
And do you have time to read a page 40 page rule book? Do you have time to not have to read the 40 page rule book every single time? If you're only playing this once a month, once every six months or less, again, going back to the time aspect, how much time do you have? And the combat system, everyone talks about the combat system. This was the big question. This was the big concern. When you have this grid based, how is it going to be, especially when you're using a die that is going to introduce some randomness and you are adding those values together, getting this icon or this arrangement, this pattern that you're going to be using to hit on the monster and see what happens. And so you're also having this combo system. And I was really intrigued by this combo system from that JRPG game that came out, um, you know, at the beginning of the year. And I believe that was Epic Seven Arise. And this is another take on that because we have not seen a great combo system between characters, allowing you to play off of each other. Like I said, in the Final Fantasy, where you can have those two characters that get a special attack that is different than any other character combination or if you're familiar let's really date myself let's talk chrono trigger right chrono trigger the best example of that done in video games ever i will stand by that stance fight me in the comment section it's an amazing game by the way combat in action here you go generating the combo taunt skill gaining combos the monsters again pre-painted the threat system how they're going to attack how the turns go in the AI deck. I mean, there's a lot going on. Now, again, how nuanced is it? How easy is it going to be going once you get the motion and the flow of things? That's fine. Gaining levels, getting the skill tree. Again, I think this is all great. How you're going to be equipping on the actual board itself. It's kind of cool. Now, this is the other part. Role play. Do it in character. When you act as the guide, you earn roleplay points. When you get these roleplay points, how are you actually going to be using them? To act out or describe what a character does. And you can turn a failure into a success. And that is the semi-controversial part. Like, do you actually want to do that? How engaged is your group? How engaged is your significant other going to be in that? I have trouble when we played D&D &D to get people to do any sort of actual role playing as their character of compared to themselves, let alone actually in character or let alone uh, role playing it from that aspect. And if I can't get it in the actual role playing game, how easy is it going to be or how affluent is it going to be in a game like this? I don't know. And that's, again, where you need to decide, is this game for you? If this isn't appealing to you, also, can you cut this out and still be okay without it? And they talk about that, and they've addressed it in the solo mode side of things where you can, you know, mitigate that and use it in a sort of a different way. Pledge tiers, we've talked about that. All of the other, you know, miniatures and the monsters you'll be getting, all the stuff, all of that we've talked about, all of that, the characters, the previews. Um, draft rule book that I talked about that I showed you briefly. Um, there's been very limited views though. It was basically one stop co op shop, Quackalope, and now Board Game Co. and Jeremy Howard. I, oh, sorry, Dice Tower. I had one too. So, five big pillars. How much does your taste align with what they're saying? Does it align with what they're saying? Is it right for you? If you don't have the time, if you are buying this out of FOMO, I would pass on this. There's too many other games for a lower price point, for a lower overhead, for an easier get to the table, even in this genre, than this. But I will also say, if you want something that is mechanistically detailed, more complete, more in-depth, more, I don't know, I can't speak to the narrative, but more avenues of depth than we have seen in those other areas this one is for you but you have to want all aspects of it if you want something that is more combo driven card driven you go with your frost haven if you want more of a true crawl on a hex based system go with something like drunagor or midara if you want more of the battle just level system but if you want the nuanced character interactions the more open side of things this is your game but if you don't want open sometimes too much of uh freedom is a, is a bad thing 
see myth, for example. But <laughs> this is not myth either. There is enough direction. There is enough detail because that was the problem with myth. It wasn't detail oriented enough, even though it was open, that this isn't going to fall from that side of things. And that is why people are super interested because the detail, the attention to detail is already there. And that's why you should back it if that's for you. Because it's the big detail, the small detail from a literal and a metaphorical in-game perspective that this is going to offer. But again, it's going to cost you and it's going to cost you a lot. So did I actually answer this? No, because if you've watched any of my other should you backs, you know, people who are saying, yes, you need to back this. And let's be honest, there aren't many videos. I don't think of should you back that just flat out say, no, you shouldn't back this. <laughs> That's how you get like angry everybody at you. Right. But I, I think the purpose of a video like this, right, is to expose all sides of things to expose different thoughts than the ones you've already had or the ones that have been going around in the echo chambers that surround you in person or online and make you critically think what's important to you. And if this lines up with what's important to you, then all by all means, go for it. I don't think, I think it's going to be a stellar game. I think your value is going to be great, but it's a lot of price for that value. It's a lot of time for that value. And all of us just don't, have all of that and then you're just buying it for the sake of having it on your shelf to say you have it and i've been there and i've done that and i don't need to do that anymore either so that's why i have a tough decision ahead of me but if you're one of those people also that has a tough decision ahead of you they do have a pledge manager that they're saying everything's going to be the same in the pledge manager so just put in for a dollar right now that's why i said that's the only other pledge level that i would back right now so if you're uncertain, back at a dollar. That is the most 